second night in a row, I forgot. Just in time for the recording. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Neil uh, from the Fimbria Theatre. Um, so I went to Beth with this crazy idea to do something for popularism, and we thought there was something nice about, you know, West and East, rich borough, poor borough, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it's uh, been a dream, the, one of the easiest things I've ever done. Um, so, oh, and welcome. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, it's, it's been wonderful. And yes, as, as Neil suggested there, that the idea was always, and in terms of how we presented the work as well, which is obviously digital while venues are still adjusting to reopening you will find that we did an open call out and we had artists applying from west london and artists applying from east london and it's the five artists who came from east london whose work you will find on finbris youtube and our west london artists you will find on popular unions youtube so a little bit of a, a kind of cultural um exchange between east and west in the spirit of um equality and and sharing between boroughs um, but I should add that from tomorrow, we will have the full lineup of all works on both of our channels. So you can binge watch them again or, or see them if you haven't uh, got around to seeing everything um, just yet. So uh, just to start, a, a small piece of housekeeping. Um, we have got audiences watching on Facebook Live and we've also got some audience members just joining us through Zoom. So hello to you and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, while we're doing the Q&A, Feel free if you'd like to keep your camera on. It's always nice to see people's faces, just like we would be seeing if we were in one of our studios. We do just ask to keep uh, microphones off just to avoid any um, interference while people are speaking. There will be a chance later on to ask some questions and you are more than welcome to post those in the chat or in the spirit of revolt and rebellion, if you want to just unmic yourself, uh, unmute yourself, and shout your questions out for our artists. That is also very welcome. Um, so I think that is probably enough from me right now. Um, I'm now going to invite each of our artists to introduce themselves and give a bit of a, a taste of um, the work they've made and also the other work they, they might make uh, beyond Popularism Festival or their sort of relationship to the history of um, the festival. So if we could start with the wonderful Kim Waxen, that would be great. Oh, that's great. Hi Kim. Hi, so um, I'm Kim Waxen. Um, the reason I got involved in this festival is that my great grandfather was Robert John Hopwood and he was one of the councillors that went to prison as part of the popular rape revolt. So we just thought it would be really nice to do something to try and um, rem well, remember him and the others that don't really get much recognition um, so I put a little booklet together and I'm hoping other family members or people anyone who knows any of the council members will be able to add a little bit of information so we get a full picture of everybody that was involved that's it <laughs> wonderful thanks so much Kim yeah it's a real honor I remember the day that Kim's application came in and it hadn't even dawned on us that we would have um, sort of descendants of the of the, uh, of the rebels or the um, activists that were involved that would want to get involved. So yeah, it was an absolute joy to, to have you there. Thanks, Kim. Um, shall we go to Isis? Greetings, everyone. Yes, I'm Isis and I'm a poet. I live in North Kensington, in Kensington and Chelsea. I got involved because I'm part of something called Portobello Radio, I'm a presenter, and the Finborough Theatre put some information out to us, and I saw it, and it really caught my eye. I thought this looked really interesting. My background is, well, I know the Finborough Theatre well, because my daughters went to school on that side of the borough, to the primary school, Bowsfield, which is not actually you know, that far away, so I used to pass it quite regularly. And I am an activist. I've always been an activist. I, I often call my poetry advocacy and poetry, and, and I, I'm inspired by, very often by activism, by events that have taken place. Like, for example, I've written about the 2011 uprising in the murdered Mark Duggan. I've written other poems with political 
political content. And I was interested because I've not heard of the popular race rebellion. And so for me, it was like another mark of British history where activism, dissent, rebellion, you know, the, that side of things what had shaped the way society was kind of run because, you know, the impact that they had with their, their rebellion against the race, it made me think about the poll tax riot, so-called, that I, you know, I was on that sort of, I, I mean, I, I managed to get away before a lot of the really kind of more, you know, heavy stuff started, but I went to that demonstration. I was an activist outside the South African embassy as, you know, on a non-stop picket for many years. I've been campaigning recently in North Kensington to save trees on Warnington Green Estate because we, we're fighting against catalysts. I've been involved in, in numerous campaigns. And so for me, I wanted to make that connection between East London and West London. There's a history here, a rich history in West London, where I am, of, of, of uprisings of people standing up against, you know, speaking truth to power. Recently, the uh, there was a film about the Mangrove Nine trial, for example, where the you know the community that I come from, I'm from the Caribbean, our community in West London often fought against uh, injustice and had to go through the courts. And so I try to make a connection in my 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 piece, which is a kind of poetic narrative about some of the history of England, because for me as a migrant, often the English history, and my, I come from a former colonised country, is all about kings and queens and the landed gentry and, and this idea of everything being the sort of chocolate box cottage. And actually that's not the real England. England is much more about real people. It's about people living in poor housing conditions and people like the people of Poplar who are prepared to stand up. So I, I took us through a little bit of history talking about some of the key moments in British history where people, working class people, stood up and fought against the system. And then I kind of made a link with sort of a couple of things that have happened in West London, but also sort of more than some more current things. So like the, just mentioning the environmental thing with the trees, etc. So that's me really. Thank you. I really enjoyed taking part. Great. Thanks, Isis. Yeah, and that, that relationship between history and the present and also looking ahead to the future is something I, I'm definitely going to be asking you about um, a little bit later on. Thank you. And, and let's just remember Scottish history as well. <laughs> I, I, they sent in the tanks to George Square. We had revolutions, Scottish Revolution of 1820. We were, we were better than the English. Uh, anyway, moving swiftly on. <laughs> see, this is exactly the kind of rebellious interjections I want to see throughout <laughs> this like my, um, it's not great People say English when they mean British. My, oh. Well, <laughs> On my mother's side, my great great, I think, grandfather was from Dumfries in Scotland, funny enough. So, superb, so. superb. I was at the poll tax riot as well. I managed to walk through it uh, when the, that uh, big quarter cabin was on fire. It was, it was yeah, quite a day that. Anyway, sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> no, this is a free space. Everyone, <laughs> no one should be shutting up. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Isis. Um, Next, let's go to um, Emily and Jodie, who were um, working together on this project. I will let you um, fight to the death as to who, who introduces themselves first. So over to you both. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, this is slightly confusing because we're split across two screens. But hi, I'm Jodie. And I'm Emily. <laughs> um so we work together on this project um i'm usually sort of on the other side of this kind of thing i also work for a venue and i help artists uh get their shows to the edinburgh fringe so um i work for a venue in edinburgh but i live here in tower hamlets and uh previous to that i've worked in television and for other events and festivals and on community work um so this felt like a really great way to sort of get involved with some of the history of the area and and learn more about it really yeah, and similarly to Jodie, um, I work for an art gallery and I'm usually, again, on the other side of this, working with artists and um, communities and in programming. Um, so it was really exciting to have an opportunity to work with Jodie on something creative um, in our borough that we live. So we both live in Tower Hamlets and um, we've taken the opportunity really to use it as a, a, as a space to uh, walk the streets and to um, get to know the history of the the kind of 
buildings and the spaces and the monuments and the area and to be able to tell those stories. Yeah, so we want with our piece, we wanted to to bring that to other people as well. We wanted people to get out there in the streets and to see some of the places where these events happened and really like feel the history and also feel how the area has changed in a hundred years and and how the places then relate to places now. So we decided to do an audio walk with a with a zine to accompany it. Um, uh, the audio walk, yeah, as I said, is, is put together in a way where you go to a place and then you can click on the relevant point in the zine and it will feed you an audio track that you can listen to and tell you about that history. And if you go around in order, it will give you the whole story of the rebellion. And we're hoping that it, it's a really nice way for people to get out there and, and learn more about Tower Hamlets as well. And we wanted to do the um, accompanying zine really to give you these visual clues to see that that history itself, you know, to look at um, we were using uh, photographs and imagery that we were find, finding from the past that was connected. Um, we were also kind of taking a liberal interpretation of some of those and using collage as a way to be able to try and bring those stories to life. Um, and we wanted people to, to walk the tour, um, being able to kind of look at some of these images and hear the stories um, and get that sense of, of history of what it was like 100 years ago of now and then also we were thinking about the longevity that in the future someone will walk that walk um, and this will be history again another layer on top of it lovely great thank you yeah this it's been interesting actually seeing kind of like I just mentioned with Isis this um a lot of artists ha across the whole weekend have really been sort of um oscillating between the history and the present and and also how a lot of the motivations of the rebellion around equality between poor and rich I mean if not haven't gone away have actually probably got worse and, and that gap has widened so it's um yeah I think it's I really hope that this work does have the legacy that it, it definitely deserves wonderful um and let's go to Marianne Sadrashani yeah, hello. So um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a theater director and a writer, theater maker. I've been making plays in the UK for 20 years. Um, I, I um, initially, and I've been living in Old Court, so in Kensington and Chelsea for 20 years too. So um, initially I didn't think the festival was for me at all because my themes haven't been very political. Uh, but I see myself very much as a local Hello. artist Hello. because I've done a lot of site-specific immersive shows in the borough. So I feel very much a child of the borough. The Finborough is my local theatre. And I love that idea of a dialogue between uh, West and East artists in London. So I thought that was a great idea. And then Hello. I thought it was an opportunity to talk about uh, social exclusion knowing that I was, quite, I was interrogating myself about what I had to say about social exclusions I've been, never been the victim of social exclusion myself. Yeah. Great, thanks Marianne, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm glad you you enjoyed that dialogue as well between yeah. East and West, that was that was an important thing for us. Um, great, and then let me just check. Yeah, last by absolutely no means least, we have Sam Tannenbaum. Hi Sam. Hello. Hi, yeah, so my name's Sam Tannenbaum. Uh, I am also a, a theatre director and a writer. Um, sort of, yeah, early career, I suppose. I'm, I'm currently studying on the, the Masters in Theatre Directing at Mountview. Um, and I, this came to my attention because I live in Kensington and um, the Finborough is my local theatre. Um, you know, really admire all the work that goes on there. And um, I've aspired to sort of try and create politically and socially engaged theatre in my work um, and it seemed like a really good opportunity to explore um, a piece of uh, seems like pretty forgotten history um, around one of you know an important um, emancipatory movement oh a bit of backing track there um, yeah um, it seemed like a great opportunity to explore that so I wrote a short piece about um, inequality sort of from from the perspective of of the bad guys i suppose from the perspective of of the middle class kensington couple um and what i tried to do with it was to explore 
this uh, contradiction of of how these people try to rationalize um, just incredible suffering when they when they see it um, and these contradictions which even within Kensington are, are really clear you know in Kensington you've got um, extremely you know extreme wealth and then also you've got Grenfell Tower and I think it's like that and that's even expanded excuse when you look at, me uh, okay and the, even uh, on a larger scale when you look at London you know it's um, even more extreme so after that I um, I did a I did a rehearsed reading of of it with two brilliant actors. Yeah, and yeah it was a great opportunity just to explore, and um, I'm really proud of what we created. I'm really privileged to be part of like such a wonderful event. <laughs> um, great. It, well, thank it's you. It's also worth saying um, the Fimbra is in a very odd position. Um, so you know, if you walk five minutes that way, you're at. Hey, Flanny's Emily's town. Okay. Who is that? Um, uh, it's um, five minutes that way, you're at the World's End Estate. Five minutes that way, you're in the Boltons with, you know, multi, multi million pound houses um, with basement extensions and all kinds of things. And historically, the Fimbra has always been, it was a very, very working class area up until about 19th. 70 or so when the area, area started getting gentrified so you know we're we're kind of sometimes the finger feels like we're slap bang in the middle with that on one side and that on the other and we're we're right stuck in the middle but anyway that's partly why i wanted to do this anyway i will shut up again great okay so on to the questions and actually i would love to start with um as i mentioned already so uh marianne and sam um, I was really struck by the way homelessness actually and that moment of encounter between people from these sort of wildly different backgrounds um, about that moment of encounter between the two and I was really interested in the way that that for both of you was um, your sort of interpretation of the brief or what it came to mind I guess with when when you were um, responding to these uh, themes of revolt or inequality or rebellion. So beginning with um, Marianne, I'm intrigued to know how do you align that history of revolt with those changes that you're now seeing in, in West London and specifically on the Earls Court Road so, so particularly as well. Um, if you could comment on that, that would be great. Um, I, I see myself as an observer uh, because again, I haven't been in the country for so long, so I'm not linked to the history of the popularism as you must be because you know about the history of uh, England and London. But uh, so I've been observing during the last two years, oh my God, um, that, uh, yeah, the la especially the, during the pandemic, yes, the Earl's Court, and Neil, you must have seen that too. Yeah, Earl's Court have been, has been emptied of his residence and we had uh, had a lot of, people in despair, lots of homeless people around. So that was really striking. And, and also mixed with these people, we had food carriers everywhere. So it was a bit of a new population, you know, in the streets and- That's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm hoping our remaining artists will join us um, very soon and that they will get the note. Um, for anyone watching this on Facebook and wondering what on earth I'm talking about, we were, well underway with our, our Q&A um, and had just had a, a lovely answer from Marianne Badrachani all about her artwork she had made and then unfortunately some uh, party poopers came in and decided to try and get a bit too involved um, on Zoom so we are just starting again. Um, fortunately I was about to turn to Sam, Sam Tannenbaum, um, to Ask him the next question. So we'll we'll press on and, and hopefully our, our other artists will be joining us while we go along. Um, but Sam, so I mean, naturally, you were working in a very um, different medium to uh, Marianne with your work, Tiny Camel. Um, but again, I think the, the way you kind of framed that encounter between rich and poor was was so interesting and spoke volumes to a lot of the themes around sort of inequality and um, haves and have nots. And, and I think also what was quite interesting for, for your work, I found at least, 
was that it was um, centered around kind of neutral spaces, so shared spaces where people of all walks of life come together. So in this instance, it was about the train carriage. Um, and I think that's something quite unique, especially in, in urban environments. So could you talk a, a little bit about sort of why that moment of encounter, where, where did that come from in response to this particular theme for you? And, and what were you trying to say with this work? Yes, I think, um, yeah, that the, the moment of encounter was, was quite important um, because what I was trying to, to do was to, to use the sort of the, the, the contradictions of like, you know, the fact that we live in one of the richest countries in the world, uh, London's an extremely rich city, and then you've still got, you know, I think one in 52 or people, I think, in London are homeless. Um, makes no no rational sense and highlight the absurdity of that through this encounter uh where you have these people who are so sheltered um that the only way that they've experienced any of these things is not through reality but actually through um things like films and tv and newspapers um and other medium um which have helped them create all these mythologies around why these things exist um, that help them deal with it when they actually meet it in person. And then when they do, uh, it's like this moment of hysteria and like uh, absurdity and fear because they don't really know how to, how to rationalize it. Um, so the, the man sort of just ends up giving this man his wallet, this homeless man he meets on the train because he, he is sort of so uh, incapacitated. He's like sort of having a panic attack um, purely by actually having to face this in real life. And he doesn't really know why. Um, uh, so I think, yeah, it was, it, it was sort of what I was trying to, to do was by, uh, playing on that and showing how absurd and kind of tragic and, but also funny, uh, that sort of encounter is when, you know, people just have no idea how to, how to cope with it, um, was, was highlight the sort of just absurdity of the whole system in general, um, to go from the sort of small, moment of encounter between two people to show you know at like a citywide level or at a countrywide level or even at sort of a worldwide level um how these things don't actually need to exist and and all of these sort of these ways of creating myths and, and fantasies around why they do exist uh can sort of bl help blind people to that and um, what happens when those those fantasies break apart i think is what i was looking at a bit of a rambling answer but i hope that was uh, answered that yeah, no, I, I well, I we always encourage rambling and tangential answers. And I think it's it is interesting. Um, and again, it's come up a couple of times actually in other pieces of work, this idea of um the imagined and and how we fill the gaps that we don't understand or that we're not a part of, or the parts of society that we don't understand. So we kind of create our own fantasies or or myths, I think is a really good word for it, of of um what those are um, and to I mean seamlessly uh, transfer this onto another artist I think that idea of um, when elements of history or people in history aren't there to tell those stories um, I think that is what we do and and I know sort of um, moving over to um, Kim and how I think one of the really most sort of beautiful parts of the work that you have um, created is the fact that and and I know if you if for anyone watching who saw our chat earlier and we were talking about the legacy of a project in in relationship to Emily and Jodie's work but I think what's so lovely with your work Kim is that you're inviting people to fill those gaps in the history um so could you talk, tell us a little bit about how you're doing that and and why you um were sort of motivated to do that as well well, we, as a family, we've always sort of known the story of my great granddad, but um, we've sort of always thought it was a bit, of a, a bit of a shame that he doesn't get any recognition a lot of the time. If you look him up, um, you might find a little bit that say he was a very quiet man. They don't really know much about him. And I think it's sad that that gets lost in history. Um, there was a lot of people involved in, in the rebellion that didn't get the recognition that others did and I just think it would be sad for it to be totally lost and, and I'm hoping they've got family around still or 
that may remember a little bit that could add it to this Facebook group I've set up, um, just so that for the future, you know, we may be able to get together a, a complete history of everybody that was involved in it. Wonderful, yeah. And, yeah. and have you had any responses yet into your Facebook page? No, no, just, just my family so far. <laughs> okay. But it's amazing, I think, how these things will, will grow and spread. And, and it's fantastic now, especially having sort of digital platforms like that, that I think yeah. people can start to fill in, fill in those gaps as what, well. What's the name of the Facebook group, Facebook group Kim? It's called um, The Poplar Rights Rebellion, The Others. Right, I'll check it out. Okay. Well, I yeah, and to help with some of it. What was interesting actually was what my uncle knew that his granddad had gone to prison, but he didn't know what for. So everybody <laughs> assumed it was something bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so something good has come of this already. <laughs> good, Fantastic. good. Because I've got the an ancestry subscription for doing my family tree, so I'll see if I can look up some stuff and uh, see if I can add anything. Oh, okay. There's, there's and my a mum's, out there when you start looking. My mum's family come from Scotland as well. Oh, superb, <laughs> superb. We get everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I'm realising uh, as was my dad's mum. I think maybe next year, Neil, instead of populism, we should do something around Scottish. What? The Scottish diaspora living in East London. Well, we'll, we'll have another <laughs> independence referendum. I'll do something. <laughs> I missed. I missed the Scottish Revolution of 1820. I wanted to do something for that, but uh, COVID took over. So uh, there's always time. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much, Kim. Thank you. And yeah, and I, I should add that there is the. Um, link if anyone watching would like to go in and look at the wonderful um, video and the um, poem that Kim wrote for the festival there is a link in the description to the Facebook group so please do fill it with any knowledge or history or ancestors that you have um, related to this. Thank you. Thanks Kim and I mean yeah sticking on the, the theme I guess of, of the historical um, and how we sort of preserve those histories. And I've seen, you know, a short walk around Poplar and you will start to notice, especially street names. Um, we have Nellie Cressel and various different iterations of Lansbury Gardens, Lansbury Square, this sort of thing, um, Lansbury Estate. So that history is really, you know, present in the, in the streets. And we even had some of the people who applied to the festival applied having just Googled their street name and wondering why it was called what it was, then realizing how linked they were to the history. Um, but Emily and Jody, your work was really taking history out of those of the streets, and then through technical wizardry that I was routinely distancing myself from because I was so useless with it, um, being able to just conjure up these beautiful um, kind of audio historical narratives and stories, um, and with this with the zine as well. Um, so, I mean, I kind of have two questions, I guess, so maybe we can divide it between the two of you, but one question is is kind of around the content of the work and, and how you found that and what was your process um, in response to the, the brief and, and of the Popper Rates Revolt. But the other that I was really interested in beyond just the content of the work was the form and the fact that you chose to work with a zine, which has this really kind of gritty DIY history through punk movements and activist movements. So I don't know who, who wants to jump in first, but it would be great to hear a bit about the content and the form of, of your work uh, for this festival. I guess it started with um, us doing a walk really and seeing what we what we noticed, like you say, the street names, the some of the monuments, um, and then starting to dig deeper going into archive material um and you know Jody did an amazing job as well of scouring the internet for content because obviously archives were not open during um the research period for the project so we lacked the ability to go and see these things the material the imagery um in real life as it were but we we um were doing a lot online yeah, we did a lot of lot of reading. Uh, so I guess we read, we did a lot of research about it, and then we kind of tried to hone it into 
the main story points. We wanted it to be a narrative through the walk rather than just random bits of information. So we read an awful lot and then had to hone that down into the main points and decide which stop would be the most relevant for each point and where the way around the walk you were going to go to to get to those points. Um, and I think the most difficult bit in all of that was actually describing the actual race bit itself, which is extremely complicated and actually very, very long with lots of very different bits of history and, and tax law involved. So, I, I mean, it took us a while to actually understand the intricacies of that and then having to write that very simply was, was quite difficult. Um, so yeah, we wrote some scripts and then uh, we did the walk with some rough scripts to make sure we had them all in the right order and had all the information. And then we actually did the recordings. Um, lots of our friends helped with voices and music and all kinds of wonderful things. Um, yeah, yeah and then- like, How do you audit? how do you audio tell the story of tax yeah <laughs> what sound describes tax yeah like kind of again get, give a sense of of space and of and of action um and i think the the zine kind of contributed to that um you took you, you said about the kind of aesthetic and it is around that kind of punk diy side and it felt like something that um you you get your hands dirty with you know like you get everything out and you're like it, it's very physical it's very tangible um that making process and that's something that um that we really enjoyed doing and also the kind of um editing you know so the whole thing is about editing it's which I guess is also what archives are about you know there's so much there and you can't know it all and you have to start to kind of cut it down to what makes sense, what can somebody understand? And we wanted people who didn't necessarily live in Tower Hamlets or Poplar to be able to kind of follow the story and understand it. And similarly, we wanted people to be able to walk it and and to get that sense of uh, the, the people involved because it is just really radical and so different for a council to stand up for its constituents in that way. Mm. And we wanted it to feel like as well when you were in a place the, the kind of person that was talking to you was there with you so they would say you know look behind you you can see this if you walk this way you'll see this so you're very oriented in the space as well so it feels like there's one taking you through it rather than just a kind of disembodied voice with you as well mm. yeah I really got that sense when I was listening to it and I also found it quite interesting and I wondered if if you were aware of this or if it was intentional but this um the fact that it is a walking tour and I know from all the applications we received so many people referred to the fact that one of the really um I don't know um one of the things people really picked up on on the history of the the rebellion was the act of marching and that famous slogan of um marching to the high courts and possibly to prison which was the the banner that they carried and I wondered if you were really conscious of the fact you were inviting people to walk specifically as as another way of engaging with it as opposed to uh, just the listening element was that something you were conscious of in the process um I think we've both done oh sorry there's a bit of echo there um I think we've both done um kind of walking tours before where uh where you it just gets you more into the history you feel like you're there so I don't know if we in we necessarily linked it with the actual march that was happening at the time but I think we just but thought we, we were on the streets I know when we were kind of doing the preliminary the test walks and stuff that sense of thinking like Poplar High Street particularly is so radically different from the descriptions of the time you know thinking about the kind of working docks and you know you're not having you're not being overlooked by canary wharf you know to think about how radically different that space would have been and for people to to gather in that way was definitely something we were thinking about um in terms of when we walked it um but we were just very mindful of having different ways in to access the project you know so we wanted to have the visual we wanted to have the audio and we wanted people to get out and about if if they could or if they chose to great wonderful thank you so much and I'm sure that people will be getting out and about and it's um yeah walking tours are something that we've seen have been really um popular actually with our with our audit we've done sort of historical tours from Pop Union before so yeah anyone watching I do really urge you to 
um, check out all of the artists' work, absolutely, but do, um, yeah, put on your trainers and, and go and do uh, Emily and Jodie's walking tour. Great, thank you both so much. And thank you, um, Isis, who has managed to come back in. It's so lovely to see you. I thought we had lost you. I was very, very worried. Okay. <laughs> The brilliant hire of the arts collective that I'm a member of, and for some reason, it obviously opened it in that account, not in my personal account. So I was been sitting and re-clicking and re-clicking and re-clicking, oh. and it kept saying the host will let you in. I was thinking that I couldn't find another link, so I apologize. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. After the absolute trauma of um, our first run at this, I thought <gasps> it, I, it might be one of our, our uh, Zoom rebels from earlier this evening. Um, but I said you're here just in time because um, you're our, our final artist that I wanted to come to and your work was so incredibly powerful and moving and I would love to hear more from you about um, kind of yeah this relationship between the historical and the present um, but one thing that really stuck out with me particular uh, that I sort of written down is the, that last line when you say um, we who dare to dissent have transformed the socio-political landscape, dipped our pens in the ink and written England's history. I love that idea so much that history isn't, because I think so often we talk about, you know, history is written by the victors or that's the story of history, but actually to say, no, it's written by those who were brave and courageous enough to dissent and to revolt. Um, I, yeah, I thought that was such a, a powerful statement to make. So. Could you elaborate a bit more on, on this idea of, of history as determined by the people that dissent or, or that revolt? Um, and what do you think the future is of, of rebellion and, and revolt um, from, your, from your perspective? So it's interesting because in the African tradition, we say, until the lion tells, I'll say her tale, tales of the hunt will always be told by the hunter so it's this whole idea exactly that you know we have to tell our own stories and as a poet and a you know a, I suppose an early career writer for me it's really important to tell stories to tell narratives to frame them and particularly as well as a woman of African heritage you know my history has not been told by my people it's often been mis mis uh, misconstrued well misconstrued but also misrepresented and so it's important to tell stories. And so when I when I think about the history of what happened in Poplar, and I think about the toll puddle martyrs and the you know the the Luddites and and you know the what happened in, in Manchester with you know the basically attacking working class people and, and you know there's so many of the histories. I mean I know earlier you mentioned the Scottish, you know, there's also the Irish, you know, many other communities in history have had to fight. And the reason that we have the rights we have today, things that we take for granted are because people did rise up, they did dissent. And so for me, I, I was struck by the, the impact of what they did, the fact that 30 councillors were prepared to go to prison, that you know, a pregnant woman was amongst them. And you know, that was a really courageous act. And it's not something that, I mean, I can't imagine councillors doing that in many, in many boroughs now. It's a very rebellious act. And I, and I really believe that, you know, that it, the history of this country needs to be expanded in the way that it's taught. So it's educational as well, because like I said, I mean, I came here as a migrant at the age of 11. And, you know, had it had, I mean, I was also educated in a, in a former colonized country where English history was, was quite prominent. And literally it was about the kings and the queens and the, you know, and it was Henry VIII and, and you know, Elizabeth I and, you know, Sir Walter Raleigh did this and blah, blah, blah did that. And, you know, even Cromwell, who, you know, there's, there's good and bad there, obviously, you know, especially the point what he did in Ireland, but the idea that there was a Republican was someone in history, you know, it, it was kind of skirted over in the same way. And, and we come forward to the 20th century and the 21st century. And it is very much, we are still at a situation where we see a lot of reverence for hierarchy and power structures. And I feel that that's, that's not the fullness of English, England's history not the fullness of world history, but certainly not in this country. There's so much more. And so for me, I wanted to highlight that. And there's so much history that I had to kind of distill it down and just find some bits and pieces. But also for me, as an activist in the 80s, when I was young and on the streets, you know, 
we had a lot more freedom to protest the dissent. You know, we didn't have all the DNA stuff that they have and the cameras and all of these things. And, you know, it meant that people could take direct action in a way and, you know, get up, get on with it. Now, I fear that it becomes more difficult for young people. Also, as you know, I, I remember the Battle of Westminster Bridge because I, I also worked as a legal, a legal representative for many years as a paralegal, and I represented people under arrest at police stations and did quite a few, you know, legal observing on demonstrations and all that sort of thing. And you know, I remember the Battle of Westminster Bridge, as they call it, when they st first started to bring in student loans, and those students had. You know, there were big protests and, and students had much more. I mean, certainly when I went to uni the first time, you know, we were paid. We got a grant to go there. So, you know, we, we didn't have the, the hurdles that students have. My eldest is 27 and, and, you know, she's at uni now. She's got a loan and my younger 25 year old's got loads of debt from student union, uh, student uh, university loans. And students don't even have the freedom now, for example, to protest in the same way. They've got to be thinking about having money to pay back all this debt. And, and people, working people are, are being squeezed and, and finding it more difficult, you know, social housing. So, for example, in Kensington and Chelsea on the radio on, on um, Friday on our show, we had a, a spotlight on the changes that they're trying to bring into social housing tenancies, which will make it far easier to remove tenancies and effectively do away with, uh, with secure tenancies. So, again, social housing tenants don't have the, the kind of breath or the, 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 to breathe, to kind of protest in the same way, because if you live in social housing, theoretically, they could use the fact that your child went on the demo, got arrested as antisocial behaviour and take your tenancy. So I feel like these things have to be highlighted because it's, it's kind of like really squeezing people. It's making it more and more difficult for people to stand up and protest. Yet, we know from history, had it not been the key groups and individuals standing up and doing that we wouldn't have changed things there's a really interesting situation which is that in the early part of the 20th century women would be prosecuted under criminal law i think it, they would be prosecuted under the i, I forgot what the act was but basically they would, they'd be found guilty of murder for the killing of a young child a baby a newborn baby and now we have this this uh category called infanticide, where we recognize that sometimes women are suffering severe postnatal trauma, depression, and, and they kill their child in, in a, you know, in that situation. It's a kind of, it's, you know, like manslaughter, it's not, it's not intentional. And it was only because juries refused to convict women. They were in such terrible states, so, so distressed and traumatized in, in the dock, and they were being prosecuted as murderers, and juries were refusing to do that and so the law changes came in that's one example and there's you know there's um, so many more popular uprising is one of those where people had to take action to change things to get a more just society so for me i i do fear that it's becoming more difficult to do that because things are becoming we're kind of going backwards in some ways and becoming more draconian and you know there's so many more laws now and you know even recently with what's happened with the pandemic you know, people who were protesting to protect the trees. You know, we had a lot of confrontation from the police who were being told we can't be there because of the, you know, the COVID risk. And so you've got to balance that against the right to voice concerns. Trees are essential to our well-being. North Kensington is one of the most polluted areas. You know, we've just had, I mean, I live, a, it's funny that you were talking about the Finsborough Theatre being located between kind of opulence and, and you know, kind of, impoverishment well I'm if I go left I'm in Latimer and I can see Grenfell Tower just at the top of my road and if I go right I'm on Holland Park Avenue so I'm in complete like kind of juxtaposition between the wealthy and the impoverished communities and there are lots more trees on the right hand side than there are on the left hand side and so you know we know that communities have been impacted by the Westway Trust flyover going above our heads by the Grenfell Tower particulates affecting people's breathing you know, trees are lungs. And so the fact that we had to balance the right to almost save the long term health and well being of a community versus the impact of this virus, it, you know, it, it puts us in a difficult position. So that kind of made me think as well, you know, when I was writing this about the trees to breathe. I mean, you know, where, where, where will we get to a situation where we can't dissent? And what will that mean? 
how will we ever will we ever see justice in situations like we saw with Poplar or in many other situations? So I don't know if I've gone off point, but that's sort of what I'm thinking. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's fascinating. And I think that sense of the unknown going completely on the question that I was asking around what is the future of dissent and, and who will be writing these stories and whose stories will be um, what gets remembered and what gets sort of written into law, I think, is at a really precarious point at the moment. I mean, we were talking at uh, yesterday's Q&A about the fact that this festival was happening on the same weekend as the Kill the Bill demo. And, and we're seeing in real time now this real squeeze on, on people's rights and, and ability to, to protest. Um, so yeah, and I mean, also we, we do, I mean, you just have to visit Poplar Union and you'll see that we're a community arts center in the midst of one of the poorest areas of the poorest borough, but our skyline is Canary Wharf when we look out the windows of our studio and there's this very strange, you know, balancing act, like you say, you go right and you're in extreme wealth and you go left and you're in extreme poverty. And, and I think- um, yeah. I would. I would just add as well that economic oppression is a massive issue. So the popular uh, activists, the dissenters, you know, they were fighting against unfair rape, you know, and this is something that affects people because, again, in the wake of what's happened with the pandemic, people from the least economically secure communities have found themselves worse off. And we know people like, you know, the Bezoses of the world have actually benefited. So the rich have got richer and the poor have got poorer. And so, you know, this whole thing about economic oppression is even more real. How will people pay their rents? How, you know, if people have been furloughed and or people have been laid off, how how will those without money fight back and how will they actually survive? So I think, again, it's, it's really real and it's, it's really visceral, the, the impact of economic oppression. Absolutely. Well, I mean, what a what a note to bring things to a close on. I hope that is, um, I don't know, motivational. As I think it's easy to despair, but actually let's channel this and channel these questions and these concerns and fears into, into productive change. Um, we are coming to the end of this evening's Q&A. I would love at this point to be saying to our audience, would you like to ask any questions um, or raise any issues? But sadly, um, I have had to be the, the police state in this situation and, and shut down the access to this Q&A. The levels of irony are not being ignored. I'm very aware of them. Um, but what I would say is um, this conversation will be on our YouTube page. It will be on our Facebook page. So please do continue um, the conversation and the debate and the dialogue um, in the threads there and hopefully um, who knows maybe maybe if our, our wonderful collection of artists will keep an eye on that maybe they can respond um, if they see any questions. Neil? Oh th this is totally irrelevant but I <laughs> see, um, you were saying earlier that you were on the South Africa house picket in the 80s because uh, I'm writing a play about that so I might drop you an email and uh, well, when we could all uh, meet up again, come over for a cup of tea, and I'll, I'll uh, oh, pick your brain. If I may. That was another thing that wrote the history of this country. So yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Super. Brilliant. Already collaboration and and new <laughs> things coming from this. Perfect. Great. Well. Thank you so much to everyone who's here right now. Emily, Jodie, Kim. Uh, Isis, Marianne, Sam, Neil, and of course, Irina, who has done an amazing job and dealt with having to sign uh, for our uh, rebels and interjectors earlier. So thank you for being gracious with that as well. Um, this does bring a close to our, our debut popularism festival in celebration of the centenary of the popular rates revolt. Um, it's been a wonderful festival. We've just I've been blown away by the by the variety and the quality of, of the work that we've shown. So thank you to all of our artists, those who you can see here right now, and the uh, five other artists whose work was shown yesterday. Um, all of the artworks will be available on our YouTube page and our website for the next year. So please do check it out. There's plenty of time to see it. Please do Jodie uh, Jody and Emily's walking tour. 
um, yeah, and, and, and do just get involved. Um, but until we all meet again, thank you very much. And thank you all. That is Popperism Festival, out. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye.